anyone who was anyone was in Paris that wonderful spring, 1923. Ezra Pound contrived an opera from Villon's poetry. Gertrude Stein was snapping up Andre Mousson's. James Joyce moved diligently from one musical event to the next. Picasso sat like a king watching the Aglets girls dance to him. Cocteau wore his hair high and Man Ray was pushing back the frontiers of photography with his studies of combs and pins. Ernest Hemingway was teaching his first baby to catch flies. Breton broke Zara's arm and Fernand Leger launched his Cuba cinema. The girls danced and the sun shone. Catherine Mansfield would have enjoyed this perfect spring. She, so young and gifted, was now suddenly dead. K.M. was perfect, wrote her husband John Middleton Murray. His view, based on the privileged insights of marriage, was widely and repeatedly echoed. Several publications with less data at its disposal felt nevertheless able to assert that Catherine was amongst the saintliest of women. Between 1923 and 1930, the eight volumes of Catherine's writings had a reception which can be described as warm. It seemed to me the most exquisite prose I've ever read. Extraordinarily alive. A whole nursery of young men imagined in Catherine a safe and unresisting playmate. For years, trophy hunters quested for apartment 52 on the sixth floor of the select hotel and hungrily clawed the wallpaper from its walls. It was alone in this room in October 1922, high above the city, that Catherine made her soul's desperate choice. She would leave behind her her reputation as a world-famous writer. She would enter Gurdjieff's Institute for the Harmonious Development of Man at Fontainebleau, a notorious place. It was here one year later, on the 9th of January 1923, she passed from this world. Gurdjieff has been starkly defined as the man who killed Catherine Mansfield, the precious, enchanting, holy, fragile, half-genius, half-saint Catherine, placing herself under the influence of Gurdjieff, whose regime was supposedly based on the rigors of suffering, hardship, torture, and long hours of meditation. His shaved tartar skull contained, it was said, a chaos of forces which cannot even be guessed at. D. H. Lawrence himself trumpeted up the judgment of the literary establishment. I've heard enough about this place at Fontainebleau, where Catherine died, to know it is a rotten, false, self-conscious place of people playing at a sickly stunt. But it was not merely a question of whether Gertie was an authoritarian who confined Catherine in a small, chill, fireless room, but whether he had wronged her in more exotic ways. She was born Kathleen Mansfield Beecham. She transformed herself into multiple alternative personalities. Cass, Katie, K.M., Katrina, Katieshka, Katerina. Her face was often described as a mask. She was pale, innocent, decadent. All her life she was either too fat or too thin. Sexually ambiguous with a husband and a wife, a lover of both sexes. In her lifetime she was disliked both as a person and as a writer and revered as both. Her letters went out in convoys, seeking assurances and making offerings, but she was also manipulative and treacherous. Her life was essentially a lonely one. She traveled too far outside the boundaries of accepted behavior for her to feel she was one of them. Nor did she find herself at home in any other group. The particular stamp of her fiction is the isolation in which each character dwells. I was born on the 14th of October, 1888. A Sunday morning in a simple wooden house built by my father above a deep bush-covered gully in colonial New Zealand. In the days of our girlhood we lived in a great old rambling house planted lonesomely in the midst of huge gardens, orchards and paddocks. As children we had few toys but far better plenty of good strong mud and a flight of concrete steps that grew hot in the heat of the sun and became the dreams of ovens. We used to walk arm in arm. The teachers found Catherine a surly sort of girl who was imaginative to the point of untruth. Her written work was too prolific, poorly written, poorly spelled, and worse still, she put herself in too much. Most of us were fat then. Cass played the cello, she loved music. Ezra Butts remembered that she played with the teachers on occasion, challenging. I've been reading a lot on free love, what do you think? Her work was exceedingly lacking in grammar, style and finish, and always blotted with ink. 
I saw you in the bath, blinking up at me, your charming, beautiful body under the water. I sat on the edge of the bath. How strange talking is. What mists rise and fall. How one loses the other, and then thinks to have found the other, then comes down another soft final curtain. But it is incredible, don't you feel? How mysterious and isolated we each of us are at the last. I suppose one ought to make this discovery once, but then for all I seem to be making it again and again. She began in London. She had 14 more years to live. Admirers were coming to read. She made the place quite beautiful. A couple of candles stuck in a skull, a lamp on the floor, shining through yellow chrysanthemums and herself in the center in a patterned pink kimono. She already practiced the advice of Oscar Wilde, who believed that the only way to get rid of temptation is to yield to it. When I am with him, a preposterous desire seizes me. I want to be badly hurt by him. I should like to be strangled by his bare hand. He smokes cigarettes frequently and exquisitely. We exchanged a look, and his glance inflamed me like a scent of gardenias. I wish to take this as far as it will go. Years later, she was to read this and remark, What rubbish! Burn it! Here is a little summary of what I need. Power, wealth, freedom. It is the hopelessly insipid doctrine that love is the only thing in the world that hampers us so badly. Force hammered into women from generation to generation. We really must get away from this bogey. Then there'll be an opportunity for happiness and freedom. She was a true extrovert and entertainer. She liked the music hall very much. She danced and sang. She liked to sing by nature. I think she was gay and cynical, certainly a moral rival and witty. When we first knew her, she was extraordinarily amusing. I don't think anyone has ever made me laugh more than she did in those days. She would sit very upright on the edge of a chair and tell us at immense length a kind of saga of her experience as an actress. There was not a gleam of a smile on that mask of her face, and the extraordinarily funniness of the story was increased by the flashes of a stringent wit. I think that in some way, Murray corrupted and perverted Catherine, both as a person and a writer. She was a very serious writer, but her gifts were those of an intense realist, with a superb sense of ironic humor and a fundamental cynicism. She got enmeshed in the sticky sentimentality of Murray and wrote against her own nature. At the bottom of her mind, she knew this, and it enraged her. Ida, who she called my wife, was with her through the depression, the recurring pregnancies and the night terrors. Catherine's addiction to the sedative veronol was the key. Catherine's mother was concerned that an unnatural relationship existed between the two women. Do other people feel as I do? So powerfully licentious? So physically ill, alone in this clock-filled room? I want her as I have had her, terribly. I feel savage. Oh, my mind is a Russian novel. My life has been sad lately unreal and turbulent. You know the unreality and the sense of chaotic grief that overpowers us when we attempt to fuse ourselves. So blind and deaf and frightened I've been lately. But now I'm happy, I'm home again. A silk shawl wrapped around my body. I lie on the floor smoking and listening. She now wrote for the publication The New Age. The free call Mansfield who refused to be pinned down and always runs away with a laugh form. But she was not well, nor was it in her nature to be careful with herself. She wrote about the mysterious man who called at Cloverly Mansions at five o'clock, carried her off to the black bed. Presumably the divan proved to be an appreciative audience for the black and silver stockings, bound with spiked ribbons and suede shoes fringed with fur. How 
how vicious I looked. <laughs> Rosalind came once or twice. I remember her, tall and gorgeous and stiff sea green silk, with her strange deep voice and beautiful face. Why does the hold the plates in such a strange way? She murmured to Catherine. The mountain, that was her name for Ida. She was used to real servants. She did not know that serving lunch for Ida was an ordeal. Lynn was fond of Catherine as a person, and not merely as a lion for her social zoo. In the earlier days before the illness set in, she tried to persuade Catherine to take her to Paris, to show her all the haunts and favorite cafes. It will be a secret, she said. We will be private and inconspicuous, just the two of us. Catherine laughed at the idea of Ottilie being inconspicuous anywhere. With her tall, commanding figure, her sweeping cloak, strange dresses and staircase hat, surmounted with feathers, but Ottilie was innocently unaware of herself. Catherine told me how she would pull up her skirt to fasten her suspender in any group of friends. I much preferred Ottilie. Jack complained always of being starved of love and warmth from looking after an invalid wife. He found considerable solace at Garsington with Ottilie. She was handsome, impeccably aristocratic, nearly six feet tall and rich. She was married but free to embark on her chosen life as hostess and veteran of the arts, pursuing it with single-minded zeal. Ottilie shared with Catherine a determined rejection of the values and pursuits of their family, and they both took a fairly elastic view of their own sexual fidelity while reacting strongly to the betrayal of others. Both learned to be suspicious of mockery and malice, but this did not stop them from being thoroughly malicious about one another at times. Ottilie herself was not unlike one of her own peacocks, drifting about the house and terrace with strange colored shawls and other floating garments. Her unskillfully dyed hair, her head tilted to the sky at the same angle as the birds, and her odd nasal voice and neighing laugh, always seeming as if they might, at any moment, rise into one of those shattering calls of the peacocks. I have no patience to accommodate Ida. Meal times and walk times are quite enough to exasperate me and lash me into a fury beyond measure. Katie mine, who is Wordsworth? Must I like him? It's no good looking across my angel. From the little tip of that cross eyebrow to the all of you. And when am I going to brush your hair again? Hold my hair and say never! But I do feel that if she could, she would eat me. Ida, you are the only one who believes in me. You are perfection, you say. 
It is destiny to serve you. I am nothing. I am here waiting. There is only one thing that holds me here, and one fear, one terror for me, that you will grow too strong to need me. Jack and I live quite separately. Our friends say that we are psychologically, sexually, professionally and spiritually not on the same scale. And then there is Ida, my confidant, my friend, my nurse, laundress, cook, bottle, doormat, sexual partner, and the bane of my existence. I met her first at Queen's College. Twenty years later, she will drop marigolds into my coffin, I can tell you. And when did this begin, this splendid commitment, this thing between consenting adolescents? Was it by chance in the elegant and deserted college waiting room under the painting of Queen Victoria? And now there is bright blood. I'm 29, and I have five years to live, and the doctor has told me to go south, so Ida and I will take the boat train. <coughs> Middleton Murray, under the circumstances, didn't want to make much of it. But her cough changes fine. I remember her gaiety, the way she would flounce into a restaurant and sweep her wide black hat from her bobbed head and hang it among the men's hats and the rats. I remember a group of men at a table running their tongues around their lips, saying oh la la and her muted laugh, delighted with herself. At night we went from cafe to cafe. Catherine appeared on different nights in different clothes, so different that they seemed like disguises. A hat covered in cherries, a cloak with a white fez, a turban with a bright lipstick mouth, a bold, confident Catherine. It's a dull day here, with wild, ragged clouds and a cold, halting, miserable wind. My black fit is on me, not caused by the day altogether. Christ, to hate like I do. I'm simply a blind force of hatred. It fills me with death and corruption. It makes me feel hideous, degraded and old. I long to destroy and I'm under a curse. I can't have Ida near. I'll commit suicide if I don't tear her up by the roots first. The worst thing about hate is that it is never exhausted. I see her great fat arms, her tiny blind breasts, her baby warmth, the underlip always full and a crumb or two or a chocolate stain at the corners, and her eyes fixed on me, fixed, waiting for what I shall do that she may copy. Think how you would feel dying of consumption and living with a deadly enemy. You can call me wicked and then mad, and you're quite right. I am both with her, mad and wicked. Well, we reached a crisis at ten, and now, after that fearful urgency, our feelings have died down a bit. She has been overpraised. She was the pioneering New Age woman, a sentimentalist. There were her illnesses, her loneliness her bad morals, her wanting a home, her ruthless lies, seen through the eyes and words of so many people, her image trembles and blurs. And then Catherine met Gurdjieff, who was described as 50% charlatan, 47% con man and 3% choreographer. Gurdjieff was born in four different countries on three different occasions, and his name was not Gurdjieff. Catherine was excited, hopeful. The more she heard of Gurdjieff, the more she liked him. A Caucasian Greek, he had traveled wide Europe, France, Afghanistan. His mother was Greek, his father Armenian, and his tutors Russian. His teachings with their concepts of multiple souls, self-observation, their conceptual and effective link with music, curiously recalled the envisionings of Catherine. Murray had an entrenched hostility to occult ideas. Catherine had not walked without a stick since November 1920, 
a lungs and heart were weak and worn, he said. He did not want to hear any of that mumbo-jumbo. Her enthusiasm was very strong. She had two clear choices, copper-bottomed Western science or spiritual revitalization. Murray was alarmed. Catherine's recovery was not in the program. His preferred scenario was that she gradually fade away, making the conversion from woman to symbol. Murray said later, I grew very resentful of anyone who offered her a miracle, whether spiritual or physical. On 29th of January, 1922, Catherine prepared herself for a journey. I have destroyed much, she wrote. If I do not return, all is in order. She then quietly returned to Paris. She arrived with Ida on the 31st of January, walked into the Victoria Palace Hotel in the morning and struggled to Mnookin's clinic for further X-ray treatment. Her heart was greatly weakened by these treatments, and she had never felt so weak. She had less than a year to live. On her 34th birthday, she wrote a note to Jack that was never posted. I cannot work. My spirit is dead. My spring of life starved. And my improved health pretense. I can only creep. It is the existence of a parasite. It's not just health in its narrow sense that I want now the power to live a full adult life in close contact with what I love, to lose all that is superficial and acquired in me and to become a direct human being. She wrote on and on and then she made her decision. Ida went with her to Avon, to the Institute for the Harmonious Development of Man, an old monastery set in acres of land. Here some 60 people of varied nationalities and backgrounds lived together in a colourful exotic community, following the various eccentric directives of Gurdjieff. Gurdjieff had her peeling potatoes and onion, cleaning the sea in the icy midnight hour, tramping around the muddy pigsty, and inhaling the vapours of the cow. She responded to the energetic life of the Institute. Gurdjieff built her a divan in the cowhouse. She was happy there a steep staircase to a platform above the cows. The divan was covered with Persian rugs each day she went there to rest. One has the most happy feelings here, listening to the cows and looking. I think one day I shall write a long, long story about it. On January 9, 1923, Catherine invited Jack to the Institute. The day was dwindling when he arrived at the gate. The minute he saw Catherine, he knew something decisive had happened to her. She seemed transformed, secure. She took him to the crowded, dusty hall. They took tea. A blend of seriousness and he shook his skepticism. Ten o'clock, Catherine went back. They had dinner in her room and then went to the salon. Climbing the steps of Murray, dark. she ran a little ahead. Catherine arrived. Running, but an effort. Like pushing ahead, she turned up. She sat in the niche reserved for the other fire. His legs. I want music. Why do not they begin? As Gurdjieff's music rose and vibrated, she registered her final impression.